very good day to you. We want to go straight into the message. I'm continuing from last time. Do not be afraid. Early in the morning, waiting on God in my quiet time room, before the sun came up, God gave me a promise out of the book of Zechariah. It's right at the end of the Old Testament. Zechariah chapter 8, the whole chapter. And in a nutshell, what God's saying to you and me is, do not be afraid, I am still in control. One of the biggest things that is gripping society today is fear. A young couple came to see me just yesterday. A very handsome young farmer, a beautiful young wife. They've got two children. And he is wrecked with fear. And everywhere you look, people are afraid. What I believe God is telling you and I, we need to take the, the, uh, put our best foot forward. We need to get into the fight. We need to stop retreating. We need to understand that the Lord says, if we build His temple, the temple I'm talking about is the body. My, my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. Your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. When, when we start to build His temple, that's our fellow man, that's our brothers and sisters, our moms and dads, our boys and girls, our workers on the farm, our employers. We start to spend time with, 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 with hands that are hardened for work. And we start to do God's will. God will honor us. Now I'm reading to you out of the, the message. Okay, it's a paraphrased version of the Bible. I've got my agricultural manual with me on the lap as well. It's right here. But I want, this is the New King James Version, but I want to read to you out of the message, Everyday English. And we start from verse 4. This is what it says. A message from God of the angel armies. Okay? God of the angel armies. Old men and old women will come back to Jerusalem. Jerusalem is not a place that's built with brick and mortar. The Jerusalem I believe God is speaking to me about and that I need to share with you, is people. We are the body of the temple. We are the, Holy, the, the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. It's not brick and mortar. It's not a place. I love Israel. Don't get me wrong. I'm going there in a couple of weeks' time. I also love Jerusalem. But the Jerusalem that I believe God's speaking to us about today is ourselves. It's people. It's God's creation. He lives not in temples. He lives in men's hearts. And our temple has been broken down. It's been eroded with um, immorality, with compromise, with, uh, with lying. Folks, half-truths are no truth. Okay? Twisting the Word of God. Did the Lord really say that? Are you sure? Bringing um, doubt into people's hearts about the existence of God. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. There's more evidence of Jesus walking on this earth than there was of Julius Caesar walking on this earth. Yet people still question Jesus Christ because that's how the, the devil works. He's a liar and he's a deceiver. And he works like that serpent. He doesn't tell you exactly, but he just keeps throwing you off balance. We've got to rebuild the temple. We've got to tell our children. We've got to tell our scholars. We've got to tell our young students in university this is the unadulterated Word of God. You dare not add anything to it. You dare not take anything away from it. Because every plague in this book will come upon you. That's what it says. And yet I read in Christian newspapers that the heads of some of the biggest denominations in the world are saying things like, was Jesus really born of a virgin? Um, the books that Paul wrote, were they accurate? Trying to change them. He didn't really mean that. Folks, you're playing with God when you do that. And that's what makes God angry. And that's why He punishes people. Now He says, if you return to Me and you rebuild the temple, I will bless you. I will bless you going out, you're coming in. I'll bless that barren womb. Th those lands, you keep reaping, reaping harvest, and you don't make any money. You put your money in pockets, they're full of holes. Why? Because you are not putting God first in your life. Let's go to uh, Zechariah chapter 8 and from verse 5. 4 and 5. Old men and old women will come back to Jerusalem. 
sit on benches on the streets and spin tails, move around safely with their canes, a good city to grow old in. And boys and girls will fill public parks, laughing and playing, a good city to grow up in. Does that happen in your neighborhood? No, it doesn't. That's right. I know. The young men that are making this program live in the city of Durban. And some of them have got little children. They are anxious to allow their children to go out into the park and play alone because of people that will come along and literally kidnap them. Those days have got to stop. You and I are God's ambassadors. We are His spokesmen. We've got to stand up and be counted. Folks, I want, to, I want to put the blame fair and square. It's in our court. We have the answer. We have the power and we're not doing the job. And that's why all hell is breaking loose on earth. We need to take authority. We need to get back to basics. We need to start calling sin by its name. And then we'll see God move in supernaturally. There's only one thing that will save this nation and any other nation on earth. It's one word, revival. Revival. A people saturated with God. A people turned back to the principles of God. A people that have got a fear of God. Folks, I'm talking about a reverence for God. Job chapter 28 verse 28 says, The fear of God, that is wisdom. To depart from evil, that is understanding. We need to understand, you cannot sleep around, young lady, and expect God to bless you. Yes, you will get AIDS. Yes, you will eventually conceive and bear a child to a man that you don't even love because you're doing things contrary to God's Word. The Lord says you must remain a virgin and chaste until the night of your wedding. Same with you, young man. You cannot go and sow your wild oats and expect to reap nothing. You will reap a wild crop. You will see a young man walking around the streets that you know is your son. And that will haunt you for the rest of your life. Yes, God will forgive you if you repent. But the sin remains. We need to understand that if you are abusing your body by taking drugs and alcohol, excessive, you can be prepared to be a sick man. You will reap what you sow. If you sow selfishness and hatred and judgment, that's exactly what you'll reap. We need to rebuild the temple. That's what God's telling me. Rebuild the temple, Angus. And I will dwell therein and bless not only your body and your family, but the nation. It starts at grassroots level. It starts with a man in the street. Where we hear the word divorce, it must do something to us, folks. It must make us sad. We must want to weep, not just, oh, well, yeah, that's another one. We've got to understand that God hates sin of any description. Okay? But I need to qualify that and say, if we repent, if we're genuinely sorry for what we've done, and we turn around and we walk away from it, God will forgive us, not only forgive us, but restore us. That's the good news. He came for the sick. He came for the sinner, like me, like you. But he's telling us today, it's time to rebuild that temple and to make it strong. Now, as I'm sitting here talking to you, you sit in there, I know, and maybe some of you are preachers, and you're saying, Angus, the job is too big. The workers are too few. Angus, we don't have time. We're not going to be able to do it. Listen to this. Verse 6, a message from God of the angel armies. Do the problems of returning and rebuilding by just a few survivors seem too much? Here we are. But is anything too much for me? Not if I have my say. I want to tell you something. All we need to do is to give God a chance to have his say. That's all. He's going to do it. You're not going to do it. I'm not going to do it. He's going to do it. We just need to give him a chance to have his say. You know, I heard a beautiful illustration by uh, Reddit by Charles Haddon Spurgeon, a man who literally shook the world, a Baptist preacher from London. He said, we need to give God a chance to have his say. The illustration he used was a man-eating lion that was in a cage in the London Zoo. 
There's a little boy that used to go there every day after school and sit and talk to him. And he loved that lion. One day some naughty little boys from the same school came along and they took stones. And they started throwing stones at the lion in the cage. The little boy who loved the lion was running up and down the outside of the cage trying to shelter this big man-eating lion from the stones. He was taking the blows himself. Spurgeon said that little boy, all he had to do was to open the cage <laughs> and let the lion out. Now I want to say to you, all that you and I have to do is to open our hearts and let the Lord in. And then there'll be more than enough. If God is for us, there's no man that can stand against us. Romans chapter 8 verse 31. If God is on my side, I am in the majority. You see, David, the shepherd boy, understood that. That's why he could kill lions. And a Goliath as well, and a few others. Because God was on his side. You can have all the armies of earth, folks. You can command all of them. If you're standing against God, you're a loser. Because no one ever comes out on top when he takes on the Lord. So we are not too few if we are the remnant. As long as as God is on our side. We go to verses 7 and 8. A message from God of the angel armies. I'll collect my people from countries to the east and countries to the west. I'll bring them back and move them into Jerusalem. They'll be my people. I'll be their God. I'll stick with them and I'll do right by them. Folks, we have many, many brothers and sisters in Christ right around the world. The more I travel, the more I realize how big God is. I was at Engedi just a year ago when that rushing mighty wind blew through the meeting. 4,500 delegates from every country on earth. It seemed like that anyway. We experienced the presence of the Holy Ghost. We have got Brethren of which we are not even aware of in every country on earth because God is moving all over. Don't feel that you're alone. You see, the one thing the devil wants to do is to isolate you. I want to say to those watching this program that don't go to church anymore because you're sick and tired of the hypocrisy. Maybe the pastor's let you down. Maybe he's got involved. I don't know. And he's upset everything. Go back and find a church. God said it is good that we gather together in His name. You know, if you go to the, 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 the big plains, the Serengeti in Kenya and Tanzania, where the huge migrations take place, and you see the wildebeest, okay, running by the hundreds of thousands, there'll be prides of lions that are going with them. The lion will never go into the middle of those herds of wildebeest. He will literally be trampled to death. He hangs on the sides for those wanderers, those lazy animals that hang behind, the sick, the lame, and the lazy, literally. And they pick them off and they eat them. We need to be careful. The devil is often referred to in the Bible as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. We need to get back into the fold. We need to understand we are not alone. We need to build this temple together. When you say, I'll do it my way, you won't do it your way. The devil will make sure you don't do anything. He'll cool you off, you'll become a compromiser, and you'll eventually die. Don't do that. Get in to the battle. The safest place to be is right in the middle of the tornado. They say it's absolutely peaceful. And that tornado is going around on the outside, right in the middle. We need to get in there. A message from God of the angel armies. Get a grip on things. Hold tight. You see, we're in a war. This is not a Sunday school picnic. This is not a skirmish. This is the last battle before the coming of the Lord. That's why you say, all hell's breaking loose in my life. Welcome to the club. But we need to know that greater is he who is within me and you than he that is in the world. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 4. That's what I told those young people. My wife had a revelation the other day, Jill, and she loves the Lord. She's an intercessor. She said, God showed her that the devil cares nothing for you and me. I'll say that again. The devil cares nothing for you. He couldn't be bothered with you. 
He's got no time for you. Don't think you're so important. Oh, the devil, the devil, the devil's against me. The devil couldn't give a two hoots for you. I'll tell you what the devil is trying to do. He's trying to kill the Jesus in you. That's what he's interested in. His war is not against you. It's against the Lord. So the, the closer you come to the Lord, the more the fight intensifies. Before I became a believer, I had a pretty carefree life, I want to tell you. When I signed up, I said, Lord, I'm going for you all the way. I tell you what, the biggest tests of my life have taken place. But you know something? Every time I've come out on top, every time I've been a winner, because God is in my corner. So just remember that. It's not always the devil, the devil. Sometimes it's you and it's me. And it's our flesh. And it's our own fleshly desires that hold us back. We need to build the temple. I'm talking about the temple of the Holy Spirit, your own life. Get a grip of things, hold tight. You who are listening to what I say through the preaching of the prophets. I told you in the last program, I don't see myself as a prophet, I'm a farmer. But then again, if you read the Old Testament, many of those prophets were farmers. In fact, I think just about all of them. The temple of God, of the angel armies, has been re-established. The temple is being rebuilt. Folks, there's a persecution going on in the world at the moment, especially in the Middle East, in the Far East, that we don't even know about, where people are dying for their faith. And we need to understand that. We are in the greatest battle ever fought since the beginning of the world. <clears throat> We've come through a hard time. You've worked for a pittance, and you are lucky to get that. The streets were dangerous. You could never let down your God. I had turned the world into an armed camp. Does that sound quite familiar? I go and visit some people in the cities. It's very sad. There's electric gates. There's barbed wire fences, razor fences. There's angry dogs. There's double locks on the door. Some of the people lock the doors inside the houses. God never meant you and I to live like that. We've got to stop continuing to withdraw. We've got to become proactive. We've got to become offensive for the Lord. What are you talking about, Angus? When we start to stand up and call sin by its name, when we start to live holy lives, to love our neighbor, to prefer our fellow men to ourselves, we'll see things change. I made a little program with uh, four of my grandsons all sitting around a table. Not one of them is older than six years old. Four years old, five years old, six years old. We put it on YouTube and it went right around the world, folks. And you know why? Because these little boys are taking the offensive. Now I'm talking about my son-in-law and I love him very much, by the way, and he loves the Lord. He's praying with his little son one night because we've had a lot of farm murders in these areas and theft and burglaries. Son, we need to pray for protection over the home. You know what he said to his daddy? He said, Daddy, I don't think we should pray that way. His dad was astonished. He said, why? I think we should pray for the thieves and the potential murderers, that God will give them food to eat, <laughs> that they'll have a warm bed that they can sleep in. Then they won't want to steal anything or harm anybody. How profound is that, folks? My other little grandson went with his dad the other day. There was a big fire on the hill. An old man that drives a broken down old car, he uses it as a taxi. The taxi caught fire on top of the hill on the road. My son with his firefighter, because it's the fire season here, at the moment took his little boy, four years old, up to the top of the hill with a couple of other farmers and they put the fire out. Of course, the car was a write-off. The old man thanked them for putting the fire out. He stood next to his wreck. My son got in his car to go back to work with my little grandson. And halfway down the road, my little grandson said, Dad, we have to go back. He said, why? He said, that old man has got no transport. He can't get back to town. We've got to give him a lift. And Dad, maybe we should think about buying him another car. Folks, I'm telling you, we've got to get back and build a temple. Now, I want to finish up because time is running out. It always is when I'm enjoying myself. It's time for building the temple. If we look at verse 12 and 13 in the message, this is what it says. My core survivors, that's you and me, 
will get everything they need and more. You've got a reputation as a bad news people. You people of Judah and Israel, that's the Christians. But I'm coming to save you. From now on, you're the good news people. <laughs> I love that. Don't be afraid. Keep a firm grip on what I'm doing. A message from God. In the same way that I decided to punish you when your ancestors made me angry and didn't pull my punches, at, the same, at this time I've decided to bless you, that's Jerusalem, and the country of Judea, don't be afraid. And now here's what I want you to do. Tell the truth, the whole truth. Folks, there's the key. The whole truth when you speak. The, the, the word of the Lord says, do the right thing by one another, both personally and in your courts. Don't cook up plans to take unfair advantage of others. Don't do or say what isn't so. Step daily lies. I hate all that stuff. Keep your lives simple and keep them honest. This is a decree of God. Folks, I want to go right down to verse 23 because I want to pray for you. Read this scripture, please. Zechariah chapter 8. Listen to this. At that time, ten men, speaking a variety of languages, will grab the sleeve of one Jew, one of us, those of us who love the Lord, hold tight and say, let's go with you. We've heard that God is with you. Folks, that's the greatest promise. That's our heritage. It's our legacy. It's our promise from God. Unbelievers, I've seen it before. They're doing it now. Taking hold of you and saying, I don't want to let you go because I've heard that God is with you. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we've heard a mandate from you that it's time to rebuild the temple. It's time to get back to basics. It's time to stop telling lies. Stop compromising. Stop agreeing with people just to keep people happy. But to get back to holiness. To put you in the center of our lives. And then, Lord, you have promised us that you'll give us the victory. That you'll give us a life that is worth living. That you'll give us a future that we can look forward to. I pray for my friends today. And after this program, they will not be afraid any longer. But realize that you are on our side. That you go ahead with us. That you want to prosper us. That you want to give us a victorious life. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, there we have it, friends. That's it. You've got it now. You know exactly what to do. You need to get out there. You need to do it. You need to be an ambassador for God. No more fear of man. Only the fear of God. Until next time. God bless you. Goodbye.